what's going on guys uh back again with another video so today we're going to be talking about shimizu and seki of oyasumi pum pum um so uh here's your warning spoiler warning ahead i'm gonna be just going i'm not using a script i'm just going to be talking about their relationship and everything that happened in the story pertaining to their relationship so if you have not seen the show you've been warned okay all right so shimizu and seki now my thoughts on them are they kind of parallel Eiko and the uh, Pum Pum in a lot of ways. And that if Eiko and Pum Pum is kind of like the vision of a toxic relationship, whereas Shimizu and Seki is a lot less toxic, or I guess in a way you could say it's over and overprotective. Okay. So it's more of an overprotective relationship. So now what I mean by that, like, is that uh, whereas Eiko and Pum Pum are drawn together, not for wanting to maybe help the other person, but more or less to satisfy their own selfish desires. So it's like they don't really know each other and the things that they want to do isn't truly what the other person needs. And so that's why I say theirs is more toxic. So it's, it's just like they're leeching off of each other and draining the other person with their expectations of what that person should be that would make themselves happy in a way. So it's, it's, it's it just comes, it, it kind of ends up pretty toxic as you can kind of see during the end, during their road trip. If I had to break down Eiko and Pum Pum's motivations towards being together and, you know, just their strong attraction and affinity for each other, I'd have to say that Eiko's motivation is she grew up in a messed up household and a really abusive one. And just she's been ignored and neglected for most of her life that she's looking for somebody that will be that she will be there everything. And she sees that in Pum Pum, I guess in a way she's kind of calling him a loser, I guess that in Pum Pum, she sees somebody who can be willing to throw away everything for her, which if you notice when they reconnected and she noticed, oh, Pum Pum's life seems to be pretty good. And she, when she notices that her attraction for him kind of drops and she's like, you know, I don't want to do this and I'll go or whatever. Why? Because she sees that Pum Pum doesn't really need her. And because of that, she knows that, or at least she believes that he can't love her in that way. But when she, but when Pum Pum told her the truth about his life and she realized that now she's like, oh, okay, well, I like you again because you're desperate just like me and you'll focus on me. Now, when looking at Pum Pum's attraction to Aiko, obviously, you know, it was love at first sight when he first seen her when, when they were kids in the class, but what really made it an obsession is the day he didn't fulfill his promise. And so he like Pum Pum sees the world as such a black and white thing, like as could be seen when he just hauls off on that one guy uh, during the road trip and just tries to bash his brains out until Echo stopped him all because he he felt like he, he could not see a gray area where the guy's trying to show him, hey, look, you know, you're going hard on, he's like, well, you're going hard on me. What about the, like the gas station for not 
create an environment for me to put that trash, uh, throw the trash away. So, yeah, you know, I'm not going to get too deep into that. But that was an example of just Pum Pum being thoroughly black and white. And so since this is like his philosophy is just like when he could, when he did not keep that promise to Echo to go to Kagoshima, like he broke everything. Right. And he, he didn't keep the promise. He didn't he didn't protect her. He hurt her. And, and by him doing all those things in his own eyes, he hates himself now. And like he always had to wrestle with that like f- forever. And it, it bled into other parts of his life. So as his life began to crumble around him, he would think of, he'd look to Aiko as like the golden age of his life and his greatest, basically his greatest sin and his most vaunted treasure, right? Like he has to make amends for that to be whole again because uh, he, he's just carrying around this guilt for not doing that, you know, like for not going to Kagoshima and for leaving her again in middle school and just just being never stepping up to the plate. And like he starts really internalizing it. And not only did he internalize it, he externalized it by hating on other people, by hating other people for putting pressure on people and for creating expectations. And so he just he would check out and just quit, but the but Aiko his his strong passion for Aiko is this is his redemption, like I'm gonna save Aiko and by saving Aiko I'm gonna save myself, and so as you can see, both of their motivations together just a Molotov cocktail we're getting ready to explode and create a it's just a ticking time bomb and it's just straight toxic. Where in comparison with Shimizu and Seki. Their relationship isn't, they're not drawn together for a selfish reason. You understand? Like, they're drawn together because they see that a hole in the other person that, for the most part, only they can fill because of their understanding of each other. So is in a way, they're they're both kind of overprotective of each other, even though it it's, it's more obvious as the way Seki protects Shimizu, whereas the way Shimizu protects Seki is a little less obvious. But if you if you paid attention, close attention in the manga, you'll notice that for the most part, Seki's a loner, and growing up, like he closed himself off to the world because of the things that happened to him. Like with his dad just being a drunk, not taking care of the business. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to the mom. Maybe, maybe did she die? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, regardless though, his home is kind of like it's just it's just it's a broken home. And the way Shimizu protects Seki is that uh, when Seki. Since Seki is so closed off from the rest of the road, it's hard for him to make friends. And then Shimizu is kind of that glue that, you know, kind of gives Seki, like, a little bit of purpose in a way. Because he's, for the most, like, in the beginning, for the most part, he's really aimless. But you can kind of tell that he has no friends and Shimizu is really, like, his only friend. And... He also kind of gains purpose in protecting Shimizu. Whereas if you compare Eiko's and Pum Pum's relationship to Shimizu and Seki's, you can see that Shimizu's and Seki's is more positive. It, like it's it's codependent, but it, it's just it's much more positive. Whereas they're trying to, in, instead of trying to build up themselves by utilizing this other person, where this person is just like an NPC sort of, right? Like it's like a, a character that's a stepping stone for their own selfish goals. That's, that's kind of like, uh, the echo poom poom magnet of attraction. Whereas Shimizu and Seki's is more edifying. It's more strengthening the other person where they see each other. They see where each other is weak 
and they fill in that void. And what the example, what well, the example of that would be in Shimizu's case, <clears throat> he's very naive. Um, I he can be delusional and too friendly and just easy to abuse. So Seki sees this and he protects Shimizu any chance he gets. And whenever he gets a chance, he tries to bring him back to reality as best as he can. In Seki's case, what you'll see is unlike the other characters, he was he had a, a rougher upbringing and he'd kind of already seen the bad stuff that can happen in the road. His father's business going down, um, his, uh, his like just kind of being ignored by his family. Uh, he saw how his dad turned him to drunk. He saw how money troubles, you know, really made things rough for their family. Uh, his dad walking out on the family. And I guess the dad came back. I'm not so sure later on, but basically a lot of things happened in his life where when he was a kid, he was clearly already more guarded. Like he's, as a child, he was where everyone else was kind of ended up in adulthood, right? And so he was very cynical or not that he wasn't in adulthood, but like pessimistic and reacting violently and just in, like has a lot of insecurities and whatever, just reacting. And he, he kind of guarded himself and pushed everyone else out where Shimizu didn't let himself be pushed away. He kind of always stuck by Seki, never running from him, never hiding from him. No matter how mean Seki would be, they'd always hang out and they were always close. And it was constant. Like Seki would protect Shimizu from his naiveness. And then Shimizu would protect Seki from loneliness so that's and so in that way they became very codependent but it wasn't toxic as they get older they be in the, they become stronger individuals and in that they start to fill their voids themselves so as you see, Shimizu gets older, he starts learning to better deal with his delusions, you know, and he starts needing Seki less and less to kind of get him through those through those delusions. I mean, even though he still sees them, but he, he's he's not operating the world as if they, they're real, at least until he meets Pegasus, which by the time he meets Pegasus, I would say is also the final growth of his character in that... When he meets Pegasus, he learns to believe in himself, even though no one else believes in him. Basically. And in doing that, he was able to be of use to someone else like a Pegasus. And so that that that's that's so he filled out his own hole. And then on the other end, Seki, like we said before, started out as a loner. But as the story unfolds, where the other characters outside of Shimizu and Seki start positive and as they grow older, they kind of end up somewhere negative along that roller coaster on, on the more negative. I don't want to say negative, but they go through more and get a they they start reserving into the like sh creating shells and just kind of curling up into themselves. But with Shimizu and Seki, as you notice, as time goes on, they start, their world expands. They make more friends. They and like hold more meaningful relationships and they start taking a less and less negative outlook on the world. You get more of this out of Seki because we hear more of his inner thoughts. But I feel the same can be said with Shimizu because the first time he met Pegasus, he ran away. Second time he meets Pegasus, he's more open to Pegasus ideas and he listens, right? So he's he's less and less scared. Like he's able to step forward and do things on his own, unlike before. Now, looking at Seki 
and how he grew into himself as an individual is you start seeing him start making bonds like on the outside like he's like as he gets older he starts getting a girlfriend he starts getting a job he looks for work he starts trying to make money and then uh on top of that he he starts taking a more out like he 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 starts seeing up the world more positively than negatively cuz it's like the like a perfect case of the example uh, example an example of this is when um the when he was when he got paid to go that do that murder for hire and he was following a guy telling the guy and he's like yeah I'm going to do this and it's just nothing to me and they they're really writing it and I'm like oh my god I hope he doesn't do anything you know messed up you know cuz you know I, I kind of grew to like his character and I'm like oh man that's just going to be too sad like or whatever but right in that moment he gets behind the guy and he listens to the guy's phone conversation and as he listens the guy's you know uh talking i don't know was he talking to his wife i don't know he was going through the guy was going through some life issue dealing with some situation and just trying to just get through the day and when he noticed like hey this guy's got problems this guy's got issues and this guy's got a lot to live for and all these things and everybody's here just trying to live their life one day at a time like like me doing this is just wrong and messed up like i don't have the right to do this and i'm not gonna do it and he when he did like and that was just a really shiny moment because during that point like poom poom was making a whole bunch of bad decisions so it was really nice to see somebody come out and do something you know i guess uh in a way good that came off as positive and uh you know, moving, moving more towards a positive future. So that was definitely nice. Moving forward in the story, Sheki and Shimizu began to solidify themselves as individuals and they become stronger and they start filling their own holes. Seki now having with a girlfriend and his friends at work and just meeting, you know, Mr. Wada, all these people. He's not lonely anymore. Uh, Shimizu doing better with his delusions uh and hallucinations uh once again meeting friend meeting uh going out to meet more friends or, or at least I uh, let me not say meet more but meeting someone who had faith in him therefore allowing him to have faith in himself so that that kind of them realizing themselves as individuals created a friction that broke their codependent relationship. Once that was broken, it was kind of hard for them to move forward the same way they'd had been for all that time. Now, what made Shimizu's and Seki's figurative break from each other different from the figurative break that Aiko and Poon Poon had is that Shimizu and Seki's break from each other came when they both found themselves as individuals outside of the other, right? So they knew each other and they were strengthening each other based on the weaknesses that they knew each other, each person had. So they truly knew each other and they... So it wasn't a superficial, it was a very deep relationship. Now, when comparing that to Eiko and Poom Poom, Eiko and Poom Poom never really knew each other. They didn't understand why each person was hurting. They just had this ideal image of the other person that they put on a pedestal and that this ideal image is what is going to save them. But when they got together, it became painfully obvious for the both of them that the person they'd imagined isn't the that person in reality. And the break that's found in each of these relationships leads the i guess we should say the the weaker party 
the Shimizu and Eiko, right? Both naive, you know, just kind of floating about or whatever. It leads, once they come to these realizations, right? Like Eiko coming to the realization that she doesn't really know who Poon Poon is. And once she starts seeing the real Poon Poon, like she even she even makes a quote oh it scares her right so now it's like she's walking with a stranger and now that she sees this change now she kind of wants to destroy poom poom right so she attempts to she tries to stab him right because you know this new person who isn't her ideal like she doesn't know what this person's thinking but she knew the but her ideal poom poom she knew what that what person was thinking but now that she realized Poon Poon isn't the ideal that she had in her head, she, Poon Poon is no longer this predictable object that she can kind of spin for her satisfaction in a way. And so that led to their, I guess, I guess if you could say their biggest conflict in that she loses all trust in Poon Poon and stabs him, right? Okay. Now, let's take it to Shimizu and Seki. So Shimizu found someone who believes in him. So with in Pegasus and the the cult or whatever. So then he starts believing in himself. And once he believes in himself, the protection from Seki becomes more of a burden because he wants to be a more active player. Like he wants to do something. He wants to be seen as useful. And he now, like, he knows who Seki is. It's not that, like, he's not looking, he's, this time now, whereas where Eiko is looking at a stranger and seeing Poon Poon for the first time, Shimizu is looking at the same old Seki and saying to himself, but now that he's established himself as an individual, he asserts himself and breaks away from this codependence. You see, so and that was that was the point of their biggest friction because he he no longer wants that protector. Like he is now they're standing, he the and that was in that moment when he tells Shimizu that you've never believed in me and you know kind of goes off on him. In that moment, it was the first time. He looked, he stood toe to toe with Shimizu and kind of broke away from, you know, the fledgling kid who needs protection type of role. Now, moving forward from these events more towards the end. Now I don't I don't know how you guys might feel about it, but if you ask me, Shimizu's dead, right? Like I, I feel like the writing was on the wall. Some people disagree, but um, it it seems clear to me that he was on that ship. Uh, after the fire, when Shimizu looks into the sky, he sees the poop god and Pumpunia, and you see uh, Shimizu there with like the other cult members and Pegasus, and they're all waving at. Uh, Seki, and then on top of that, now that he, he's seeing the delusions, I look at it as like that trauma from seeing what happened to Shimizu kind of put Seki, gave Seki his own delusions and kind of put him closer to understanding Shimizu. And we've seen this before earlier in the story during the fire when the thing exploded. And, Shimi, and then Seki got scared, freaked out, everything. Uh, things turned out okay. But at the end, Seki walks up to Shimizu and says, yeah, the poop god's real or something. So I feel like that was foreshadowing to say that, like, as these things happen, he gets closer and closer to uh, Shimizu to understanding him. And that seeing Shimizu die put him in the shoes of Shimizu seeing his own mother dying. So th that's just me personally. And so now I feel that Seki's going through these hallucinations. And that was the kind of hallucination when uh, Shimizu comes out and he's like, 
hey, Shimizu, and Shimizu's like, who are you? Nah, but that's neither here nor there. But, okay. Basically, the death of the dependent party, or I guess every party is kind of dependent, but the more, the, the naive party, the more, the, the weaker of the two parties, the, the one that needs to, protection because Shimizu or not, not, not Shimizu, Seki and Poon Poon are the protectors of the other party in a way, right? So now when the protectors, when the person that they're supposed to protect dies, when they fail to save them or get them to the goal or whatever it is, when they fail, it, it almost, it lifts the burdens of those characters and it kind of brings their life into a bit of a full 360. So with Aiko gone, Poon Poon, you know, he obviously attempts suicide. Sachi doesn't let him, you know, probably one of the most best scenes of all time. We all know the story. We know the rest of what happened. Then on, uh, Seki's end after uh, Shimizu dies you can see that he's even more immersed in the world and that before he would never go to some school functions and stuff like that or reunions and now you see him going back mixing it up you know he I think he even dressed up for the occasion I'm not sure but like you kind of see him spreading his circle and just not really just kind of keeping his circle tied down to him and Shimizu, you know, for the purposes of, you know, protecting him that night and things like that. So you kind of see Seki, you know, just going out and doing things for himself in life. And that about wraps up this analysis. Um, really love these guys relationship between Seki and Shimizu. Very special. Uh, as we've broken down, had a lot of parallels to um, Echo and Poon Poon's relationship, but just more positive and more optimistic and definitely just something that you were rooting for at the end. And I can honestly say that in a story where the majority of the relationship seemed like a, a deep hole of hopelessness that just led to a lot of suffering for a lot of the characters, Shimizu and Seki contrasted this darkness and were essentially at least for me a real bright spot in the story the the light at the end of the tunnel the star in the middle of the night like they were really special it was bittersweet to see them grow apart but that growth was the sign of the strength that they had given each other so like i said it was bitter to see them split but it was sweet to see them grow because they essentially helped give each other the strength to be the best version of themselves and it played out as they became stronger individuals on their own so yeah, and I'll leave it at that. And yeah, uh, thank you for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next video.